Hello there, hello, hello, and welcome back to the show. This is the big show, the podcast, the Hobnobbin with Slim Man podcast, where we have conversations with creative people on both sides of the show, Biz Curtain. We are coming to you today from Palm Springs, California, from deep inside of the Slim Shack. We're going to have a listen to my chat with sax player Will Donato. He lives not far from here. He's in the neighborhood. And he's going to tell us all about his wild journey in the music business. But before we talk about Will, let me tell you about all the new news here in Slim's Shady Trailer Park. On Monday, I went to see my friend who lives nearby. He's a guy named The Wiz. And uh, he told me about his new invention, a spray-on compound that removes old wax from surfboards. The stuff is non-toxic, environmentally friendly, and big-name surfer dudes have already endorsed it. It's going to be huge. My friend, The Wiz, he's a chemist. We met a bunch of years ago when his wife, well, his former wife, asked me to sing at his birthday party. And uh, we became good friends. So anyway, Monday evening, Wiz showed me the promo video for his surfboard wax remover. And I got to tell you, it was pretty impressive. And then Wiz looked at me and said, Do you know the two most important words in the English language? <laughs> I, I was going to say something stupid like, send money. But I just shut the hell up. Anyway, according to the Wiz, the two most important words in the English language are what's next. That's what he lives by. Now, he's a guy who could easily retire without a worry in the world, but he likes to keep moving, keeps growing, keeps moving forward. What's next? What's next, slim people? On Thursday, I had uh, lunch with my friend Peace Man. He looks kind of like Jeff Bridges in The Big Lebowski. And even uh, dresses in the same kind of style. He's a business guy, but what he really is is he's like a big hippie at heart. Anyway, the first time I met Peace Man was a couple of years ago. I was doing a show up at Big Bear Mountain, which is about an hour or so outside of Palm Springs. I was doing a concert there, a jazz fest. And when I finished, I went over to hang out. And I started talking to this guy, just small talk. And I noticed he was wearing some blue suede shoes and I told him I really liked him. Then he looked down at my two big Sasquatch looking feet <laughs> and guessed that I was probably a size 13. And you know, he was right. I told him I wore a size 13 and that's what he wore too. And then I introduced myself and he gave me a peace coin. It's a silver coin, a little larger than a nickel. And it's stamped with a peace symbol. And peace man gives them out to just about everyone he meets, and that's why most folks call him Peace Man. He gives out peace coins. Well, anyway, a month or so later, I'm doing a show at a club called Spagatini in Seal Beach, California, and when I took a break, Peace Man came up to me and handed me a shoe box, and inside were a pair of blue suede shoes, size 13, imported from Italy, and they fit like a glove. <laughs> I felt like Elvis Presley was really kind of thoughtful. And since then, Peace Man and I have become amigos. I mean, not just because he gave me some shoes, but we kind of hit it off, and we've been good friends ever since. What else? All right, I didn't cook but once this week. My friend Abe came over. He's 97. He's a great guy. Reads the news, takes care of his mind and body, always looks sharp, dresses nice. He's really with it. When he saw me, for instance, he said, Where have you been, Slim? In prison? I haven't seen you for a while. He's got a sense of humor. I cooked him dinner, chicken piccata, and a Caesar salad. But the thing that really got me excited was that I made pasta carcio e pepe. Now, what is carcio e pepe? It's like Roman mac and cheese. It's basically pasta with butter and cheese and fresh cracked black pepper. I made it for Abe, and well, I thought it was great. It's funny, nobody else mentioned it, but I liked it. She was just so nice. Anyway, the recipe, she's quick and she's easy and she's a delicioso. I put it up on the slimmancooks.com website, free for all slim people. All right, folks, let's check out my chat with Will Donato. He's a pretty good sax player. Yes, he is. He's got a new CD called Supersonic. I had to listen, and it's lively. It's all up-tempo sax instrumentals. 
my friend Tateng Katendig plays keyboards. And yeah, he sounds great. Will sounds great. The CD sounds good. And the t-shirts are really cool. Will and I became friends when I moved to Palm Springs a couple years ago. Uh, he took me out to lunch, and ever since then, we've become good friends. Will has been really gracious and helpful to me, and he's a genuinely friendly and humble guy. And he's got some fun stories about Richard Marks and some not-so-fun stories about his health scare a few years ago, which I think you'll find inspiring. So let's check out my chat with sax man Will Donato. Basically, you do two things. You do the the Will dance Donato, the, the dance thing, and the Will Donato and you love do the fest. Will Donato love, love fest, fest, right? So Will Donato is is all original music, stuff that you've written, all the, right? All, all the way, almost. All I mean, you, you don't you rarely do any covers, or do you do some covers, or just one every once in a while? I do covers that I recorded that I know drive my show. So, but for the I, most part, you do two things. It's Will Donato. It's mostly original stuff. It's all sax instrumental stuff. I'm, it is. I you know what? I do a lot of choruses that are sung, and I always seem to be lucky. Somebody in my group sings, and it's also a way. You know, I select songs where they can sing, like an "I'll Be Around." The audience can go, "I'll be there." Yeah. Right. So it's a way for an instrumentalist to have a vocal component. Without having Pavarotti. So for the most part, the songs are instrumental. Yes. Sax. And then sax. sometimes during the songs, you'll have like a chorus where people, yeah. can, where you have on your records where people sing. Uh -huh. So in other words, people can actually identify the song and sometimes sing along with it. And then you also do that dance thing that I saw you do, like the, one of the, the, and it's fun. I, you know, I you know, I know, I know you play it down because I, I play down my like little rap pick, pack thing too because, you know, you're playing along with tracks. You're sitting over in the corner, but you had such fun with it. And I forget, like one of the first times I saw you do that, it's you're you're doing modern music and you're playing with a bass player and a, and singer. a singer, and it's you on sax. It's yeah. a trio. And you're playing along with tracks. And I'm I saw playing you, rhythm sax. Right. A lot. I saw you playing at the Riviera, which is one of the coolest hotels in Palm was that Springs. Cool or what? Uh, it was great. We missed it. And you played by the pool. We loved and I, it. And then I loved walked it. in. I loved walked it. in. I walked in and I saw you. And somebody says, You got to go see Will play the Riviera. I'm like, The Riviera? Because I'd seen pictures of it. And I was always intrigued because it was. I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. I loved the fact loved that they it. took an old place, loved spent it. $60 million dollars to make it look old, but no. Thought about you when you were going to move down here thinking, he needs to have cocktails at this bar, at yeah. this place. So I walk in. I walk in, right? And I see you. And the thing that really amazed me about it, I mean, I, I like that music. And, I, and it was nice to see people dancing. Yeah. How you remembered everybody's <laughs> name like you know like the, there was like a maybe a hundred like what like a hundred hundred and fifty people yeah. there right on, a, on a good night and it's like oh and here's dr so and so <laughs> and you'd make a joke like don't go to him if you ever hurt you know and then uh, you'd see somebody else walk in and you remember that and here is over here and, and look who's walking in right and you make some silly joke and i'm thinking man this guy has got the greatest memory I've, I've ever witnessed, you know, and, and you were like, you were kind of charming, it was kind of funny, and the music you were playing was, it was cool, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, wasn't your original stuff, and then, you know, I, I didn't realize that you, that you were actually doing original music with your own CDs yeah. and they stuff. Would take because, a TV track and like yeah. you would do it. You yeah, know what's I mean, funny I, because is, I, I, I do, I do the same two things, right? Yeah. I do the Rat Pack stuff where I'm just kind of me it. and a microphone sitting in the corner where you know no. people walk in and go, "Is that Slim Man? You know, yeah, <laughs> who's that over there singing? <laughs> Tell him to turn down, will you?" <laughs> and then you, and then you do that for like you know fifty concert. to a hundred people, right? Yeah. And and then like you know like two weeks later you're playing in San Antonio for two thousand, you know, and you're doing all your original stuff mm -hmm. and people are going crazy. And they want to carry it's, on your shoulders out of the yeah, venue right. and then at it's, the after party. Yeah, right. And you're doing like radio interviews and, and, and yeah. newspaper interviews and T V interviews, right? And then you go back to your little like thing in the corner where you're playing that thing. It's it's kinda strange, isn't it? 
You know what's funny is, yes, um, at the same time, oh boy, I had a strategy when I started. I didn't want to wear a tuxedo at a casual or corporate party. Right. And so I thought, I'm going to design my own people, band. People outside of California don't know what casuals are. What, when you say a casual, it's like when, a wedding or a, yeah. a, a, a birthday party. It's a casual. It's not actually casual. It's you dress up in a tuxedo for a casual. <laughs> they just call them They just call them casuals, right? I like to laugh, so you can hear right. a lot so, of laughing. So, they, so you, you did or you didn't want to do casuals? I, I thought, you know, I'm a pretty high energy guy but I laid back on social contracts and uh, y- you know I wanted to have a uh, corporate uh, way of making money that's away from originals that was really relaxed so this is funny so I, I actually had it down on my infamous uh, talking points is funny I never tell people this but my project called Artist Sax is going on its 28th year Right, so you've been doing this kind of dance thing, cover stuff the for like a long time. So when people, we, I always notice when people like us get off the road, sometimes folks, they don't realize it's a little tough when you get home. It's like, I was just big in, uh, at Syracuse. And, and then you're waiting for, I've always had this to fall back on. It's not a plan B to me. It's just there it is. And it's always fun. So when you do the Will Donato thing, you're just playing all live. When you do the artist sax thing, you're playing with tracks. Now, how how many how did you get started doing the Will Donato? Because you've been playing sax for a long time. I have a funny story because I got a scholarship because I was valedictorian in high school. I don't mention that very often. Did you play music in high school? I did. I was gigging at 15. You were gigging at 15? With a German band leader named Kirk Golitz at country clubs. And you're going to laugh at this and you're going to think, now this is all making sense. I didn't just go to my high school prom. I booked my own band at our high school prom. Well, <laughs> we we need a band for the high school prom. Do you know anybody? Yes, yeah. me. Yeah. Well, you're going to your high school prom. Yes, I am. And you're playing your high school prom. And yes, I, took, I am. I took one of the cheerleaders. <laughs> and she was my gig date, not right. prom she, attendee. She was your roadie. So you graduate from high school. You, and you're, you're gigging like doing like gig gigging. gigs like prom gigs and and then you go to where I went to pre-med at Baylor pre-med yeah scholarship you know my family's medical at Baylor Baylor which is a tough school yeah it is it was the year that they were it was the year that was so competitive on lab practicals people would move pointers on dissected animals so or pages would be missing in the days before internet on stuff you needed in the library so um I uh you had a 4.0 at Baylor. I mean, I had a 4.0 out of high school, and I went to Baylor on scholarship. Uh, and I decided that I didn't really like it. I was still gigging, too, in Texas with, like, cool bands so, and stuff. So I transferred back to California because my father's in the Army. And I went to Cal State Fullerton and sailed through it. It was nothing like Baylor. So, uh, studying what? <laughs> I got my degree in urban planning. Like landscaping? No, you know, like at city city halls. I know what you yeah, mean. Sorry, some people, I know some what you mean. But you know what? I, I was thinking on the drive over here. If he asks me that, it wasn't a plan B. I swear to God, it wasn't a plan B. It was like, well, I don't want to learn piccolo, and I don't want to learn counterpoint. I just want to be the guy that stays in front of the band and plays saxophone. When did you start playing sax? Um, I started clarinet. You started on at clarinet third grade. And was like the you're just playing in the in the Did band the thing. Yeah. But I remember there was a place. I'll be going back to Denver this summer. Uh, Denver has such. Uh, Is that where you grew up? Yeah, basically. I mean, we were are an army family, so we've lived everywhere twice: Germany, uh, Texas. We've lived everywhere. My father was a colonel in the army. He was an optometrist. There. And uh, fun guy though, not not a typical Colonel Clink. You know, long hair, <laughs> jean jacket kind of guy. He was kind of Robert Blake. Robert Blake rather than Robert Duval, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> Fun guy. Funny. Charming. You know, and so, I, and so you started playing clarinet and, and just regular grade school yeah. and then playing in the band? I was a serious clarinetist. I studied with uh, Dick Joyner from the Denver Symphony. Really? And I uh, was all state orchestra in, in Colorado, and I that's where I kind of met Nelson Rangel's brothers and a lot of Colorado musicians. But Nelson Rangel, the f- killer fl- fl- fluter, yeah. saxophone player, whistler. Yeah, and we all kind of came up from Denver. But 
He's still out there, right? He's great. Lovely guy. I mean, still in Denver, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So, what's, so what's, when did you transfer to, uh, when did you, did you go over to sax? My father bought me a saxophone home when I was 14 and a half. And I remember it was a Dick Stabile alto. And I remember in my car listening to Don Myrick playing the solo from Reasons and Me and Mrs. Jones. And I heard that, that was, that, I got goosebumps. That original live solo in Reasons. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. And then the, Miss the Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yeah. And who was doing me and Mrs. Jones? Billy Paul? Billy Paul, but I, the sax player was Don Myrick too, and that, that cut. Mm -hmm. And so, was it, was it hard to go from, I mean, they're both reed instruments. It wasn't hard to go from clarinet to saxophone, or was it? No, it wasn't hard at all. And, and, um. I took to it right away, and I have to, a funny story. We probably all have some similar, similar story, but you know the famous trite cliche that folks have to fo force their kids to practice? They actually had to knock on the door to make me stop. Really? <laughs> yeah. It does make a difference when you practice. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. th there was a time there, like, um, I had a, I had a gig in, in, in Italy, and like, for like, what, I, it had been booked a year in advance, and, and I said to myself, I said, you know what? If it ever comes time to a situation where I'm sitting in a club or in a bar in someone's house and someone asks me to play a song on the piano, I'd better be well, well prepared to do it. Yeah. So I would spend like an hour or two at night going over my song, singing and playing on piano. And I'd spend an hour or two just about every night, right? It was amazing how much better, you know, the, that, you know how much better I got at doing that. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of, there's something to be said about meditative the, it's so hokey but the thing that we're I now want to just get my horn out even Kirk Whalem says just get your horn out and put it in your freaking hand right if your brain starts it. and, and, it, and a do, lot of people don't realize that that musicians the, that the musicians these days they're not just musicians they're social media marketers. You're designing your own CD cover. You're booking your own sessions. You're, you're booking your own gigs. You're a booking agent. You're managing your own career. You're setting up photo you're shoots. You're doing a radio interview at a guy's recording session. <laughs> right. And you're propelling a show. 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, the only thing that a lot of the artists had to do, like the Beatles, all they wanted to do was write songs. They didn't want to become great musicians. Yeah. They didn't want to become great producers or engineers or social media marketers or, yeah. you know, they just wanted to write the best songs ever. And what did they do? They wrote the best songs ever. I think we are the luckiest musicians alive right now, and I'll tell you why. And I know we can throw a rock and hit one of our buddies that thinks the world's coming to an end and nobody sells records, but oh my God, how lucky are we? I'm thrilled to do this because I like out of the box thinking. And one of my favorite podcasts is Mark Marin. Me too. And he tells people, I did my craft. I did all the shitty comic rooms in the, in the, in the country. And until I started this podcast, things turned around for me. He's doing theaters now. You know, there are a lot of guys out there who are just, you know, pulling out the sword every day. You get up in the morning, you get out of bed you pull the sword and you hack your way through the jungle yeah. and you don't stop and put that sword away until you go to bed at night speaking of Mark Maron I heard Weird Al Yankovic on his podcast a couple nights ago and Mar Marcus is so candid as you are I thought okay I don't really know much about Weird Al Yankovic he was telling Mark about yeah I do county fairs and then Mark's teasing him. He goes, so what's your fan base now? Still 15-year-old boys? And But you know what's funny? He, you could hear it in his voice. He loves what he does. Yeah. I'm the same way. I woke up this morning. I look forward to this. I'm going to play music tonight. I'm in the studio. I, I'm having fun. You have kids? How many? I have a beautiful stepdaughter. And uh, I inherited a lovely stepdaughter through my wife, Diana, and uh, she's the coolest girl. You know, she never looked at me like I should be a banker. She uses our terminology, Dad, have a good gig, and she calls me on the road, and that's oh, just fantastic. from our sponsors you know I've never made homemade pasta 
I mean, I might learn one day, like when I decide to make ravioli or tortellini or one of the stuffed pastas, but why make your own pasta when you've got De Checo? It's the pasta I've used for the past hundred years or so. My mom used it, my dad, my uncle, my grandmother. It's available in most grocery stores, Di Checo Pasta. I use the Di Checo spaghetti when I make my meatballs. I use the farfalle a lot when I make my pesto. And the penne rigate is my go-to pasta when I make my tomato sauce. I really do like the Checo. It's consistent and it's delicioso, especially when it's al dente. So do yourself a favor. Check out the Checo pasta next time you're in the store. It's in the light blue box with the Italian farmer gal right there on the cover. The Checo pasta. She's a son nice. Are you looking to buy or sell a home in the Palm Springs area? Well, are you? It's starting to cool down a bit out here. And if you want to buy or sell a home, I suggest you reach out to Cindy Guzé. She's with Berkshire Hathaway. They're a nice company, huh? Cindy Guzé has been living in the Palm Springs area for the past 20 years or so. She knows the real estate market like nobody else. She's got years of experience and she's the go-to gal if you're looking for a condo or a house or a vacation home. As a matter of fact, when Guns N' Roses were in town for the Coachella Festival, they turned to Cindy Guzé to find them a place to rent for a couple of weeks. So no matter what your real estate needs are, you need to reach out to Cindy Guzé. Give her a call, 760-485-2505, or send her an email at cindy.guzé at outlook.com. That's cindy.guzé, G-U-S as in Sam, E, at outlook.com. And now, and now let's get back to my chat with Willie D. I'm talking about sax man, Will Donato. In, in L.A., if you're not from Los Angeles, especially in the mid-80s, there was a lot of showcasing going on, like at the Whiskey. Uh, Richard Marks's manager saw me at the Whiskey. You know, kid mullet by that time, you know. Um, and this is what, the late 80s? This is probably like 88. Right. And Cause was leaving Marks. So David, Cause Dave Cause. was his sax player. S- sax player. Live. He did like the year tour. So no, that. So Dave Cause is playing the Richard Marks. Richard Marks sees manager, you. The manager sees me. Oh, the ma- Richard Marks' manager sees, sees me you. at the whiskey, and they have a meeting with me. And that's the time where things were a big deal. I mean, I'm yeah. like, I had to go down to Sunset Boulevard, and it was called West Bank Management. And you literally, you know, in L.A., you go up a, it's like eight stories, yeah. and there's like a lawyer guy. And I'm just this little reggae kid, you know. I mean, I was jazzer too, but... And I'm very aware of what's going on. And I, I could already figure out... I was always intuitive. I could always feel... I could tell who was probably also in the circuit going for the gig. I could feel it. But the guy said, you're it. So then they, they, they said, you got the gig. So they had me sh- go to a video shoot, and I shot the video Angelia. I'm in Angelia on Richard Marks. Yeah. The song. You're on that video? I'm in that video. I got a mullet and cowboy boots. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so check this out. So I do the video, and it's exciting. Dude, it's big budget. Millionaire. Millionaire. Richard Marks, 88. The height of his career so we're in this barn in santa maria dude and sunlight santa maria california yeah sunlight's coming through the barn like wow you know it's like and he's got that giant burgundy head of hair and the jeans and the fancy belt and i'm just like looking at his hair like how the hell does i mean back then it was this big like a lion mane a lion mane and i'm back there just with the sax so you're you're playing on the video or are you playing on his cds too here's the story so I shoot the video because he's going on tour. This is after he starts getting a little disenchanted. Richard Marx is getting disenchanted yeah. with the music business or yeah. with his career uh, or with his life or something. I don't know. I don't no, know. You don't know. He's, you I'm shooting the video. He's, 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 and he, he's, there's catering. Yeah, there's the, people. I sit right next to catering. I mean, I'm, I mean, it was like big time. I know. Right. Big time. Right. On a video shoot. Hundreds of thousands of dollars to do a video. <sighs> big. Right? MTV. I'm sitting next to him having lunch. He's a super nice, charming dude. And I'm sitting there thinking, I am so broke. 
I really need this tour. My family needs this tour. I mean, I even lost, I mean, I was always slim, but I was like, oh, you know, yeah. t-shirt tucked in, boots. Right. I was one of them. <laughs> so, but we were so broke. I needed a tour so bad. So I passed all the things, and I'm going to these meetings on, on Sunset, and it was really exciting. We get this call that Richard decides he wants to go on hiatus for a year or two. And then when his next album finally came back, about three years later, it was called Paid Vacation. I don't know if you remember that album. No. I'm thinking. But you know what that did to me? And it's probably why I love artist sax. A lot of our, on our genre, everyone likes to say, oh, that's Bobby Caldwell's guy. I oh. learned early on, wow, if I'm the sax player for the Pointer Sisters and one of the Pointers doesn't want to go on the road, my mortgage doesn't get paid. What did you do for three years? Well, after the big video, and you thought it was going to be your big break with Richard Marks. I started and, Art of Sax. So you st that, that's when you started the band? Yeah. Oh, way back then? 1990. So you started, like you say, I'm going to just put like a band together to do regular gigs just and while the while I I'm waiting God, for the rest of the stuff? Maybe except for this year. I never tell people this because I, I, I don't want Why? people... Why? No, I mean, I don't want people to think... You know, sometimes when times are tough, I didn't want people to know, but we've always worked four and five nights a week for 28 years. When did you do the first Will Donato CD? So this is where our <laughs> shared friend came in. You're gonna love this. So I'm playing with Steve. Can you Oliver. Just give me, just give me a year, and then, and then, and then we'll get back to the backstory. Ooh, let me what, think when was the first Will Donato CD? What year? 2003. 2003. Okay, now That's tell your story. David Munoz. Then now tell your story. So you're, you're. I'm on stage in San Antonio, at Balcones Heights. So you're doing a jazz festival with Steve, Steve Oliver. Oliver. And you're, and you're and you're Steve Oliver's sax players and, and, and Steve Oliver's and Dave, playing you know, guitar. Dave, Dave sits and along the stage and he's got the, uh, the David San Antonio Munoz fans. David Munoz is a jazz guy who's had a radio show every Sunday in San Antonio for the last like really seriously twenty five years. Lovely man, yeah, great man. Yeah. And he had the jazz festival, the Balcones Heights. It was outdoors by the little, uh, the pond, and people sat on a national uh, natural amphitheater. Beautiful. And Steve Oliver's playing guitar. You're playing for a couple of thousand folks, and you're Steve Oliver's sax player. David Munoz brought you guys to the Balcona Heights Jazz Festival, and this is what he said, and this is why I love him. <clears throat> you know, you really ought to go solo, Will. <laughs> he said that? Just like that. And I took those words to heart because I just... And it wasn't you know, until... You know, Will, you really ought to go solo because I... You know what? You know how it is in L.A.? You just want to be the world's greatest side man, you know, like like kind of a Greg Vale. I, I don't... I, well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I wasn't thinking that way. Even though I fronted my bands, I just thought... The way smooth jazz was presented to me, you don't, you can't dare be a front man until you are like signed with GRP back then and all that. GRP, the famous jazz label. label. But Dave goes, you know, Will, you really ought to go solo. So after he said that, what did you do? Did thought, you go you back in the what? studio and write? Steve Oliver actually helped me a lot, and I went and recorded my first record at Steve Reed's studio called the Slam Steve Reed Studio. The I've been in there. I know yeah, the one in a, in in in, a, yeah. in Hollywood, yeah. or Los Angeles, right? Steve Reed had a crazy studio. He, it was fun. He kind of lost his mind there for kinda a while lost his with mind and I was, drugs. Right? Dude, I was I was in that period of time. You were you were there when? But he funny was, story on that when I was in that studio. You know that studio. It's very organic if you're listening to this radio broadcast, but. He even had the We Are the World uh, console. He was real proud that he bought that We Are the World console. The, we are, the, the console that they used to record We, we Are, are the World, world this, yeah, with Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones and all those guys. So I remember hearing stories at the studio. As I'm recording my record, my first record, I'm really excited. I'm thinking, I've heard a lot of stories where Cashel spends the night here and wakes up in the morning and so and so. And I said to myself, I'm kind of an urbane guy. I'm never going to be one of those spending the night guys because I got to coif and, and wax and right. detox. And I said, I'm, I go home every night to my wife. Well, three nights later, I'm on a futon. <laughs> it's a yeah. slap jack with like, and Steve, and Steve Reed is waking me up in the morning with a grass skirt and a hammer saying, we're ready to go to work, Mr. Donato. <laughs> right. So you recorded your first CD there. And I enjoyed and how it. And did, how, did, how did it? How did it get received? It wasn't like a, a, a instant thing, right? Didn't it take a couple of CDs for you to hit your stride? Because it's just been recently where you're playing in Portugal and yeah. and in Spain and stuff. It was like steps and, and steps, right? You know, How many CDs have you done? I'm on my seventh. You're working on it right now? Yeah. Here in Palm Springs, but I've been doing California. Other stuff too, but, but you know what's funny to me, Slim? I, I never really thought... I, I have a respect for like 
the forefathers that have been around, you know, like the Bronze and the Elliots. Rick Bronze, Rick Richard Bond. Elli- Rick Bronze, trumpet player, Richard Elliott. Sachs relative player. to what I thought I was doing, I thought I was doing fine. You know, I'm like, I was paying my dues. Yeah. And I so I didn't think of it like, I didn't think I was missing out on anything. I thought, okay, I'm doing the steps. And the one thing I do have to concede to, I didn't really quite understand. I did, but I didn't. I, I did release radio singles. You had a radio promoter, and he yeah. promoted your singles, and they started taking off. Yeah. And so you started just getting gigs, the like rather than rather than just like doing gigs in California. When did it start breaking out where you're going to here and there as a solo artist? I think when what I year? signed with Mighty Music, uh, which is an entertainment agency in New York. Um, and uh, what was that? Uh, probably about. Nine years ago. So about eight, nine years ago, you sign with an agency, yeah. and they start getting you gigs, and that's when things start breaking yeah. out, right? And, you're, and you just keep releasing CDs, and you're Releasing out there CDs. doing everything that makes fun, sense. Yeah. Did you ever hear from R- Richard Marks again? I mean, could, is he the kind of guy that you could call up and say, hey, Richard, how you doing? How's your hair? Yeah, you know what? Oh, yeah, this is a funny story. So the, so when after he retired, three years later, he comes back and has an album out called... Paid Vacation? Paid Vacation. And... I thought, wow, what's going to happen? And I swear to God, I'm intuitive in a funny way. I remember seeing Tower of Power with a new sax player with fuzzy uh, mullet, and it was huge groove, Steve Grove. Yeah, and I the thought, sax player. I thought, I can just, at the time, they, we didn't have Chase Huna's running around back then. We had Chase Huna, the young sax yeah, yeah, we had There Palm was just Springs. a handful of guys that were showmen you could feel it back then and yeah. I thought that guy is going to get the gig because I'm not interested now I'm, I'm kind of out of the loop and, you and never, sure enough I see that Steve Grove used Grove got the next Richard Marks thing that probably only lasted about a year or two but I thought so I, it was kind of funny because it was cause they picked me Richard retires and then a huge group gets the gig so have you ever heard from Richard Marks again I saw him and when Fitz had him at a Fitz Jimmy Fitzgerald. Jimmy Fitzgerald, uh, a promoter, program, yeah. guitar player, singer that that books a lot of gigs out here at the very famous McCallum Theater, where all the big guys play. Yeah, see, you're so disarming. I'm just we're having a conversation. Um, he was in that Ringo Starr thing. Uh, yeah, with Ringo was a Starr of the and, and Joe Walsh and and, and Todd Rundgren, yeah, right? Yes. And I was Who like, was in that? Oh, was Richard great. Marks was? Yeah, he was playing just strumming guitar. It's actually kind of cool. Ringo, can I play with you, please? Yeah, and Ringo's just hanging out. Yeah, right. you know. He'll hire, I'll hire anybody. Give Richard Marks a gig. But you know what? It's funny. In this business, everybody gets kind of, uh, I wouldn't say humble, but. Yeah, it is. It, he it, moved it, to it, Nashville. Richard did? Yeah, because he said he wasn't fabulous enough for Los Angeles. Another one of our wonderful sponsors here at Hobnobbin with Slim Man is the Foundation for International Aid to Animals, helping animals by helping people care for them. The FIAA is a nonprofit family foundation based right here in the U.S. of A. The FIAA has pioneered sterilization and treatment programs for homeless and sheltered dogs, and it also helps people with limited resources treat and care for their pets. Check out their website, aidtoanimals.org. You can find out all about the great work they're doing for abused and neglected animals all around the world. They give support to wildlife rescues, sanctuaries, and reintroduction programs. They've funded documentaries to bring attention to the problems of homeless and unprotected animals. And it's a real inspiration to see an organization that cares so much, that does so much to help. And if you get inspired, there's a donate button. That's right. Donate to aid2animals.org. And now let's get back to my chat with saxman Will Donato. When did your whole cancer thing, and how? When did that happen, and how? How did that? Uh, Two thousand ten. I. Um, so that was seven years ago. So you're kind of making CDs. You're in your stride, and all of a sudden, what happens? How do you? I had a lymph node that was swollen, 
What was like? What were you feeling? Like, were you getting up in the morning going, my throat sore? Or? I didn't feel bad at all because I'm high energy anyway. I just felt the lymph node was kind of swollen. But people don't know who the, what their lymph nodes are. I mean, oh, but but that's right. You're pre med. I'm sorry. It was the size oh, of an almond. Oh, okay. And so I, you're feeling like a lump on your neck? Yeah, my wife's like, quit playing with that thing. <laughs> Can you be more specific? Um, and I went to the doctor, and I'll never forget his words, Slim. January 20th, 2010, he said, I have a concern for cancer. Damn. And, you know, it's kind of an interesting phraseology. So I started a game plan. Um, and April 16th, I had my surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix. So it, between January and April, it's like, okay, we got to do something about yeah. this. And in April... In Phoenix, Wait 2010, there. you just you get an operation to remove uh, uh, the growth, cancer, the cancer, and the lymph node. I find out is and that's just, right on your throat, right? Yeah, and I originally my father was just so. When you know you you've got a wonderful father, when you, you it's weird to hear your father break down on on a phone call, and my dad because he was a med- medical guy in the army called some old school guys in Newport Beach, California. And I went down and met with this old timer. And at the time, he was still selling scalpel and knives. And I was pretty bad off, actually. I wanted to live. So I wasn't, you know, for a guy that likes to groom himself up, I just wanted to live. So this guy was selling scalpel and knives. So I'm picturing, you know, Roger Ebert. I'm thinking, well, I, I, if I have to be Roger Ebert, I'll do it. I want to live. You know, I mean. And then finally, I went t- to a second opinion and. The guy goes, these idiots, don't they know that you play saxophone? You So they recommended laser, a laser protocol, which oh, is so totally they, different than So they started so they they did it with a laser where they cut it out. What, like what, was the doctor like saying that, hey, you might not be able to play sax ever yeah, again? Was it really that was a conversation? Yeah, and, and and I'm you know, at the time when you're kind of scared well, I, when you're scared shitless. Yeah. You're like, Okay, well I guess because you, you don't know. I mean you, I go to a guy that looks official with plaques from the AMA and you're like I, I so they decide to do this experimental laser surgery, and the guy says, "You know, you might not ever be able to play sax again." No. And you said, "I couldn't play before." <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's horrible. So I mean, that that must have scared the living shit out of you, right? But you know what? I wanted to live, my brother. If I, 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 and I this is how this is how resourceful your, your little brother is. I'm thinking, well, I could do harmonica, I could do guitar. It's kind of a yeah, you know, I'm being silly, but so um, you 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 did this surgery, right in the in the middle of your trajectory, like you're just yeah. starting. Because like, I remember, no, I, I remember, I, had like, to pull I out remember a, hearing about you in Palm Springs. I had to pull out a sea breeze. My first that would have been a sea breeze break. jazz festival, which is a huge, you know, ten thousand people. Jazz it was a big fest. festival for me. It was the right time that I needed, and they had to pull me out of it. So, so my, you you so you actually got those words. You might not ever be able to play again we don't know what's going to happen yeah. they did the laser surgery and what happened diana i mean you're me here I mean, diana myself and three dogs we went over to phoenix your wife yeah and you have three dogs we have three dogs we all little dogs we all went over to phoenix we got a suite for two weeks i went and had my surgery they said we need you in town for two or two maybe three weeks for any follow-up emergencies and uh you know and then i had scars from the surgery uh. and just Kind of scared, sitting there in an embassy, beautiful embassy suites, you know, and, and with the kitchen and all. It was nice, but and the doctor told me, "You can't play for three months." And I'm thinking, and I never cheated. I did not even pick up a horn. And ironically, comedically, this was the time of my life I was starting getting some endorsements. So I'm getting these pretty little shiny gold mouthpieces in, in the mail forwarded to mouth me. Pieces, over there. Sax sax mouth mouthpieces, sax mouthpieces. So not only am I like dying on the vine here, I'm getting these things that are like so, musical porn. So <laughs> you're the guy who's working seven nights a week doing two different gigs, the Artist Acts, the Will Donato original Love thing. Fest. And a doctor says you gotta take off for three months and, and of course you did, right? You didn't I you didn't touch a thing. Yeah. I mean like how were you eating? Was it tough to eat? I mean, were you just drinking fluids? I mean, what, what do you do when you have your throat sliced you know, open? The usual like uh, the the puddingy yogurty thing yeah right smoothies but you know what my friend just the prospect of living and a second chance kind of ameliorates wow. anything that's just creature wow. comforty so I can't imagine but you know what's funny I never broadcasted it. only a couple people knew I was going through this because I didn't want that ah 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 
and even some people like Steve Oliver were no they they were aware but they weren't aware. I, I didn't want people to know. I, I'm I, with you, man. Like, like if something like that ever happened to me, I'd be like the lion. I just want to go out in the woods and like die. <laughs> I don't want everybody else to know. You, you know, in this modern era where people tell you what they had for lunch on the oh, what kind of different oh, bread yeah, they use, yeah, right. nothing. Absolutely. So because I had a good team around me, Slim. I had loving family, killer doctors, and the people that really mattered to me, like my record label, my booking agency, they knew. And I and a couple of people, like if I had known you at the time closer, I, I would let you know. But I'm not one of those guys that shills for empathy. So what happened? It's three months. You're just laid up, and so you went after a couple of weeks at the Embassy Suites. They say, you know, Will, you gotta do what? They released me. Finally. And they said, go home and, go home and do just what? Chill. What did you do? Just chill out. Chill out. Like, here's a guy that's working seven days a week yeah, for was, 20 years. Was, and and all, How do you chill out? I mean, what are you doing? Like, sitting by the pool? Oh, uh, I forgot what I was doing. Oh, I know what I was doing. How stupid I am. Before I went into my surgery on April 16th, I released my most successful single at the time, which got picked up by... This thing called Arch- broadcast architecture. When smooth so, jazz was- so one of the big uh, consultant guys said, "This is a this is we we love this. the kingmaker said, let's make this a hit." Yeah, and it, it so you're you're you do your surgery the day two before- weeks two weeks in Phoenix you, and you go home and the day before my surgery, I sent my tracks for mixing with Darren Ron. So here's the comedy here. Who's Darren I'm, Ron? The Darren Ron, the producer, who's like okay. a Paul Brown. Sorry okay. about that. So I'm laying in my bed pushing the button with the morphine thing and I'm watching the smooth jazz channel and I'm kind of watching my smooth, my single rise, you know, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the hospital. The joy of that single taking off and messages I'm getting from Adam Leibowitz from the radio promoter radio promoter was just amazing with, with like not a lot of, what was the name of the song? Funkability. Funkability. Great song. So, um, you're just laying out in Palm Springs for three months watching the single take off doing nothing. No, 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 I'm doing something. What are you doing? I wrote my CD called What It Takes while I was down. You wrote your CD? I thought you were supposed to be lying in bed or something. I had my laptop and my good ear and I wrote... Your good ear? What do you mean? I mean, I I used... I couldn't play my horn, so I wrote my entire CD uh, in about three weeks while I was... uh, The day after surgery, I was already up on my laptop writing What It Takes... My CD was released. Writing it? How are you writing? Like just tapping things out on the keyboard on a computer? Yeah, it's a good CD. Yeah. You're just sketching out songs yeah. on a computer? No, I shaped everything too. You shaved everything? Shaped everything. Shaped, shaped everything. everything. Yeah. And I did do some shaping. That was very <laughs> tricky. But I wrote my CD in my recovery time. So then when so, I... So wait, whoa, 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 whoa. You're writing a CD on your computer like in what, like Garage Band or one of those types of things and you're just tapping notes out and rhythms out and stuff like that? Yeah. Basically, after three months, are you jumping for joy and like doing cartwheels or was it was it a, a gradual like another three months where you, you pick up the sax and your first my note first, you're going, my first, help me. My first gig was a friend's wedding. A really good friend of mine, a beautiful uh, lady and her daughter was getting married and I said, you know... This is my first time back at your wedding. I said, I, I'm, I, and she goes, I really want you there, Will. We've been friends forever. And I said, I, I, I don't even know what's going to come out of the sax. I, I'm I, scared. She goes, I, I just want you to be there. So I re- still remember that gig, Slim. I mean, I literally could. <laughs> so this was, the, the wedding gig was an uh, Art of Sax gig, like you and Eddie and the singer guy? July. July 16th when I could play. It was months. July, so April, May, June, three July. So exactly like three months to the day, right? Three day I could play. And I was literally and looking what, at what the did, day. What did it sound like? Did you hurt? You know, it was it was really weird because I'm one of those guys that thinks, ah, you can ride a bicycle, get up again. I'm like, oh, sh- shoot. I mean, the it felt kind of weird. It did? And you know what I was also conscious of? I kept hearing you know these words from the doctor. You might blow out some stitches. I'm thinking, well, it's three months. So part of me, because I'm very aggressive, I'm a real aggressive player. I'm thinking I can't default to my aggressive nature. So, you know, if I was just playing an iwi, like, I would Electronic be Electronic wind instrument. instrument. But I know how aggressive I am on an alto sax. So I'm thinking, so I told Eddie, I'm going to bring a jazz mouthpiece, and I'm going to bring a soft read. I'm going to take up space. What is a jazz mouthpiece? Like a hard a jazz mouthpiece and a soft reed do to help you with your ailment. 
no resistance, almost. So it's a, br- it's a, a, a mouthpiece that's a little easier to play, and it's a reed like, that's easier easier you know, on your lips and throat. It's like you want a bass throat. with a low action, maybe, where it's I've, just yeah. But I remember the sweetness of this lady just saying, "I don't care." Stand. So when there. did you get back into the full swing of things? So this gig it went okay, right? That that night you go home, or are you like? bleeding or are you are you exhausted or you have oh you know what it kind of inspired me i thought you know hey i'm fine i feel good and diana goes oh not so fast they're slick <laughs> you know, I was like, all so right. after that gig when was your next one how long did you still or were you just going were you like all right i'm I back, back in. Don't I, just jump right in I jump back in and have you have you had any problems since you know um for the listeners when you do this type of thing you have to get there are no in. listeners <laughs> But yeah, f- did you? Well, I'm having a blast. Mean, did, did you? Um, I had to. I had to. I had to have checkups happen? every six months. You have to have to check up every six months. A straight ahead guy. I'm still freaking glad to be standing there, even if he yeah. doesn't give me a, a time a freaking day. I'm still glad, and I love my well, drive down there. When you're playing, you know, when you're closing the show, I'm sitting in real time, going, "I'm having fun." Bro. Take me to the river. Take me to the river. Yeah, we did that. And, and it was but whatever with. To the keyboard player Hans Zermula, he grabs me by my legs and gives me a <laughs> piggyback ride around the stage. I couldn't I believe that I, was Hans ridiculous. Is one of my friends. Yeah, it's, we're talking about the KSBR yeah. Bash. It's a big uh, festival for a couple thousand folks where they have all kinds of musicians on stage jamming, and we closed the show with "Take Me to the River." And you did a little solo, but anyway, uh, thanks, thanks so much. You, you know, know I what? love you. I, you uh, know I love you. Are we all covered here? Is there anything you want to say? Anything you want to push? Anything you want to promote? You know, uh, I have you got stuff the, coming. I got a brand got new CD coming out called Supersonic. And, and, Supersonic. Uh, I saw the t-shirts. They were nice. The t-shirts were good. And glad that I had this chance to talk about it. And you know, I've, got, I've got nice tour dates coming up. And I love celebrating people. It's a, it sounds trite, but that's you know, what we I do know, here. You know, like, uh, I love it. When I first met you, I'm like... This guy is so positive and so like full of positive energy. I'm like, there's got to be a, like some kind of phony baloney crap behind it. But you know what? You, you <laughs> that's you, man. Dude, no, <laughs> you know I'm what I mean? Here. I know. Sure. I'm like, we go out and have lunch and we just yeah. talk and chat. We've good been time. good friends. But anyway. you know what? You were talking about the memory thing real quick too. Even that, I'm not trying to be Gary Trudeau, a informational guy and Guthy Ranker. I do the memory thing because my mom had died of Alzheimer's. Oh. So I thought, you know, I'm going to do a little tribute that's personal to me that I know I'm doing it. So I'll walk into a room and I'll try to really be conscious when I'm introduced to people. So then like a dumb guy, I go, hey, this is actually good for business. You know, like a Brian <laughs> Regan voice, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I swear to God, some nights I'm really tired. And I go, I see a table of eight. I go, I can't do this, especially if there's Cheryl, Cheryl, Sharon. I can't do it tonight, but I do it. Yeah. It's, a, it's for my mom. Are you, are you feeling good now? Yeah. I like your health and all. I feel great. All I, right. I'm disciplined, but all my right, brother, I had such a good time. That was great. I, I wish you nothing but success. All right. Thank you, Will. Let's hug it up. Well, that was fun, huh? What a pleasure talking with Will Donato. Talented guy. Nice guy, too. He's got a new CD, Slim People. It was released last week. Make sure you check it out. It's called Super Sonic. I guess by now everybody knows how to get in touch with people. You type Will Donato into your Google search, and there you go. D-O-N-A-T-O, Will, W-I-L-L, Donato. He's a good man, and he's quite the showman. If you ever get a chance, check out one of his gigs. He does a good show. Yes, he does. All right, let's close the show with a song, with a slim song. What do you say? Remember the whiz? I told you the story about my friend, the mad whiz, the chemist. Well, when I went to play his birthday party many years ago, he requested this one song. It's the very last song on the very first Slim Man CD, End of the Rainbow. Let's take a listen. This goes out to the whiz. A song called Another Like You. And it goes a little something like this. I 
realize how much I miss the love we knew And I find myself in front of the place where we first met All oh, the rain came down And then I saw someone that looked a lot like you Reminder to me, there will never be 